big discussions going on nationally uh, all about this high-speed rail track which is planned. The House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee, chaired by Lord Hollick, has today published their report, The Economics of High Speed 2. And we are now chatting with Joe Rukin. He's the campaign manager for Stop HS2. And we're going to ask him what he thinks to this report. Good afternoon, Joe. Evening, Fran. Yes, now then, um, are you pleased with the report? Well, the Lord's Economic Committee have basically said everything about the economic case that we've been saying for the last five years. Uh, the, uh, the business case is flawed. The case for HS2 hasn't been uh, justified at all. The costs of £50 billion, is it really worth it? Mm. Uh, you know, they're saying that 82%, basically 82% of the benefits of HS2, which they are very sceptical about, work out on the cash value of time. So if you go mm. faster, yeah. you can put a cash value on the time that you save, and all of a sudden, it's worth billions to the economy. Mm. You know, they've said very clearly what we've always said, that this isn't about helping the Midlands or the North. It's about getting things to London, because that's what all the international evidence says. And, uh, you know, it's just another one in a very long list of independent reports. You know, this is the Lord's Economic Affairs Committee. We've had in the Commons, the Public Affairs Committee, the Treasury Select Committee, the Environmental Audit Committee. Uh, God, I've missed one. Uh, right, <laughs> yeah. right. uh, the National Audit Office as well. They've all said more or less the same things, that the case has just been completely made up, and it's very speculative and, quite frankly, spurious. Why should they make that the case, though? Because, look, uh, they do argue that there is this would solve overcrowding on the trains. Now, what do you think to that? Well, what, see, this is an argument that's only been chucked in recently that, you know, that this is going to be all about capacity. And the reason you say that mm. is that everyone who's been on a train has been on a busy train. Like, it's a long time since I, uh, you know, it's about six, seven years since I got a train in Bradford, but I was amazed at just how bad it was. You know, it was two carriages. Oh, it was absolutely crammed in. And you're just thinking, why is this so packed? Why it's not rocket science? Isn't this train longer? And, um, you know, so the thing is, everyone who's been on a train has been on a busy train. So saying it's about capacity sounds good, but the problem is HS2 delivers capacity where it is needed the very least on the long intercity journeys, not the short-distance commutes which most rail passengers make. And as a result, what's going to happen is the normal fair-paying public and the taxpayer, which is one in the same, are going to be subsidising something which is only going to be for the richest in society. Because it's not just the fact this is going to supposedly cost 50 billion quid to build, and I say supposedly because that's all on 2011 prices, four years out of date, before you know, before you have another three years before you even start construction, 20 years before the buffers go down in Leeds. Hmm. But also... You're gonna ha it's not going to make a profit. They forecast that it's going to make a profit because they plucked passenger numbers out of the air, very much like happened with HS1 in Kent, which is meant to be cut, uh, carrying 21 mil sorry, 29 million passengers a year by now. It's just managed 10. Everywhere you look across the world, there are only two high-speed rail lines in the whole world that actually make money. Mm -hmm. So this thing is going to need a massive subsidy, and we're going to have to pay for it while cuts are going on elsewhere. One of the arguments is it will rebalance the economy if uh, perhaps you've got everybody building this, if a lot of extra jobs, um, extra services, um, the materials. What do you think about that then, Joe? Well, to be honest, the jobs figures look a bit made up as well. You talk about the extra jobs. Yeah. There'll be jobs in the construction. There's no doubt about that. Sure. That's a fact. However, you've got a load of people currently building Crossrail and HS2 is due to start being built as soon as Crossrail's finished. Right. So, you, you know, you real, realistically, what you're going to see, instead of creating jobs, you're just not going to be making the people building Crossrail redundant. Yeah. And there will be a, a few more jobs. But in terms of actually creating jobs in the areas with stations, there's no guarantee whatsoever that will happen. And as I say, every bit of international evidence shows that you'll just suck more economic activity to London. You know, the past Transport Secretary, Philip Hammond, said uh, when we were only talking about Phase 1, it will put Birmingham in Zone 3 of the underground. And that's really what this is about. It's about 
extending the commuter belt at London, benefiting a few businessmen who work out of, you know, Leeds City Centre and Manchester City Centre, mm. and everyone else paying for it. Is it an argument that uh, we haven't got any big industries anymore? What, one among them, we've got house building, haven't we, and building. Now, there has been the argument that what about building the second phase first, which might perhaps help local stations and, and local transport, um, perhaps, you know, the, the second phase going through Manchester. Uh, would, that, uh, would that perhaps make jobs and save money? Well, there's an argument for that, but the better argument is you don't really need the north-south connections so much. You need the east-west trans-Pennine okay. connections being done. And just look at the electrification project that was due to be, well, it's meant to be happening at the moment yes. across the Pennines. That's on hold. Really? You know, oh. Network Rail, yeah, Network Rail oh. put that on hold last week really? after it had gone over budget. Uh, and they're awaiting a further clarification of the scope from the Department of Transport, whatever that means. Mm. But the point is, the electrification that's being promised isn't happening as, as we speak. You could, for Sheffield, you could reopen the Woodhead Tunnel. Uh, for yourselves in Bradford, you could reopen uh, Skipton to Colne, which might not be great for passengers, but you could divert the freight that way. So you could have, you know, two new... Uh, routes across the Pennines, uh, Skips and Coal, uh, the 11 miles of missing track there, and Woodhead for about half a billion quid, and and the electrification of the current route through Huddersfield, and you could probably do the whole thing for a billion, maybe. Well, I say that not knowing how much uh, the, the current electrification has gone over over budget, but you get so much more capacity, you actually deliver the transport links that are needed that are going to help commuters in, in Yorkshire and Lancashire. And, you know, you, you deliver the, the economic growth, if there is to be any, where it's actually needed. The very last thing that you want to do if you want to rebalance the economy is make it quicker and easier for people to get to London. Obviously not cheaper for them to get to London, but quicker and easier. Yeah, OK. Uh, you make some good points there, Joe. Um, I know we're all feeling... Thank very you very much. Yeah, we're all making... Uh, well, we're all looking forward to having a new station over there at Appley Bridge, which is we're going to be talking with people in the next hour about. Um, yes, I mean, local links, um, you know, between the whole of Yorkshire are very dear to our hearts and, as you say, will help northern economies rather than being uh, sucked down south, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. You just look at, say, just look at Leeds. Leeds is the largest city in Western Europe without light rail. And you imagine that if all these cities that are going to get HS2 were told, well, instead of HS2, you can have five billion each, would they come together and say, oh, no, we want a high-speed railway link? No, they'd spend it internally, quite yes. clearly, on things that would actually benefit the people who live in the area. And you put this against the backdrop of the cuts that are happening, and it just seems quite frankly obscene that so much money is being spent at a time of austerity. You know, where you actually had, there was a, a, a debate today on HS2 in the, well, in the Westminster Hall and side room in the House of Commons. And the Shadow, the shadow Secretary of State for Transport, she was actually trying to make a point for HS2. And she said, well, you look at the Great Western electrification up to Bristol and, and Cardiff. So that's, that's gone three times over budget. And she was, and you think, well, if that's gone three times over budget, and HS2's got a budget of 50 billion, then why are you, <laughs> why are you making this point? Because surely you're saying, well, HS2's going to go over budget as well. And we know it's going to go over budget because the costs are out of date. Yes. But, mm. And you just wonder how you can possibly justify spending so much money for a project that will benefit so few people. Um, well, somebody it, likes it, somebody likes it, Joe. And one wonders... They're not going to make money out of it, aren't they? <laughs> so, always with these things. Yes, there are vested see. interests at play, mm. and there are stubborn politicians who don't want to look stupid by changing their minds. And in mm. some cases, yeah, changing your mind, admitting when you've been wrong about something in the face of all the independent evidence might actually be a sensible thing to do. Because if you look at the polling... It doesn't matter where you look across the country, the public don't want HS2. Hmm. Right then. Well, uh, there's an election coming up, of course, and I suppose uh, before the election, nothing can be decided definitely. So you, from your point of view, that would probably be a very good thing. Um, but what's the next step as far as the uh, Stop HS2 campaign is concerned? 
Well, we, uh, you mentioned the election, and obviously our job at the moment is to make this as toxic an issue as it possibly can be in the run-up to the election, so, you know, so, so that more and more politicians will have to try and justify um, their, their position if they do support HS2, because when they try and justify it, it's very, very hard to do it. You can say a lot of things which sound like they might be right, like it's this magic wand that's going to rebalance the economy. Yes. Which, but as soon as you look into the facts, and this is the thing with this report and all the other committees and independent bodies that have looked into HS2, you know, you can look at the Institute of Directors or, uh, or uh, the Taxpayers Alliance or the Institute for Economic Affairs. Um, there's loads of them that have all done the, these reports. And so, no, bad idea. Yeah. So obviously we need to be keeping pressure on the politicians. Uh, hopefully, you know, one of, the, one of the three major parties will eventually break ranks. Um, we won't know that that's going to happen, but we can only hope and seeing how things pan out after the election. Obviously, at the moment, you've got both the Green Party and UKIP in opposition, so they will hopefully be raising it at the, at the election. Knowing I'm on uh, BCB, I did try and look up uh, the where, where respect are on this, but I can't. They, they haven't mentioned HS2 apart from in the context of HS3. Interesting. Uh, hmm. But it's very important for us to make sure that this is a t- toxic I- issue coming into the election, and the House of Lords have really helped out in that respect. So you would say lobby your MPs before the election in the hope that uh, they think you will vote for them if uh, they are approachable and uh, perhaps friendly yeah. towards your point of view. And, of course, engage in the process because, for example, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of hustings meetings that will be coming up in the near future. And I, you know, say to people, ask the people who want to be MP for whichever constituency what, what they think about HS2 because you'll find, a lot of them find it very hard to justify. And, of course, all the politicians from the major party will be, have been sent a briefing about HS2, which, when they spiel it out, might seem quite convincing. But it, it's interesting to see that some of them will actually go against the party line on that. They will say, well, actually, this is what I've been... Well, they won't say, this is what I've been told to say, but I'm saying yeah. this. Mm. But they will go against what they've been told to say. And it's just important, we feel, that this issue is brought up at the election because it's a massive amount of money at a time of austerity. And it's not just the cost of building it. It's the cost of subsidising it. And it, it's just socially inequitable, really. Well, an interesting issue. Lots of good points and interesting points you've made there, Joe Rukin, campaign manager for Stop HS2. Brilliant. You suggest that people lobby their MPs with the election coming up. Uh, and if they would like some more information, have you got a website that people can we look at? We have indeed got a website. It okay. is stophs2.org. And that's uh, the number two, so stophs2, or one word, dot org. And uh, you can find us on Twitter as well, 